Hello, everyone. <laughs> hello, hello. Can I get your attention? Well, welcome to our event today. Um, thank you so much for coming. I'm Gabby, the community manager at Cake. Um, I'm really glad that you're all here in this rainy day, and thanks for making your way here. Uh, before we commence, I would like to acknowledge uh, the traditional custodians of this land and pay my respect uh, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, uh, both past, future, present, and future. Uh, well, uh, I would like to thank Shine, uh, the drink here, that it's in a startup from Sydney as well and is uh, sponsoring here today for our drinks uh, and they are from the Northern Beaches, so really cool to have them here. Uh, also, ob obviously Cake, uh, my amazing team, uh, AWS, <laughs> Tank Stream Labs, and obviously these amazing panelists here. Uh, without them, we wouldn't um, do this amazing panel and co-produce for live streaming. Hello, everyone at home. Uh, and obviously, uh, Sarah here, um, that she's going to be our host today. And we're going to have a Q&A. And please feel free to stay later. Across this hall, we have a bunch of drinks and a lot of food for you after this, so you can network and talk with everyone. So welcome, and thank you so much for coming. I'll pass to you, Sarah. Thanks so much, Gabby. How cool is it to do in-person events again? It is amazing. Those of you tuning in online as well too, maybe we'll get you here next time in person, right? All right, the great resignation, remote work, hybrid work, no bones day, understood the assignment. These are 2021's most popular words and phrases. So clearly what we're here to discuss today is not just a to topic here at ANZ, but globally. My name is Sarah Stevenson, and it's my pleasure to open up the discussion on global startup teams and the future of work. When I first started in recruitment 10 years ago, millennials is what we were hiring. And with millennials, they said that we cared more about vacation leave than pay rises. The Yahoo CEO, Marissa Meyer, said at the time that people work where they work for two reasons. One, the quality of the people that they're surrounded with, and two, feeling like the work that they do has meaning. Sit with that for a second. Give me some nods. Does that feel like what you're after today though? No. Marissa Meyer also to told everybody to go back to office then too. So now that's chuggy and we're moving on into globalization and the future of work. So technology advancements and the catalyst which was the pandemic has altered what employees are looking for, challenging employers to think innovatively on how to retain talent, managing remote high-performing teams, and navigating policy. So how do we fish in the big pond? How do we hang on to our best people and ensure more productive, higher performing, more diverse business athletes? Now I'm from Amazon, so there's a famous Jeff Bezos quote that I'm gonna share with you. And that's that customers are always beautifully, wonderfully dissatisfied. We can consider the same of employees, right? Even when they report that business is booming and they're super happy, they're still likely wanting more flexibility, more for their career, and frankly, more fun. So show of hands, who thinks that a startup's most important asset is their product? Anybody? Don't be shy. Oh, okay. Oh, panelists go first and then the crowd goes after. I, li I like that. What about their leader, like an Elon Musk, a Jeff Bezos, somebody you can get behind? Is that most important? Okay. What about beer pong on Fridays? <laughs> what about their people? Yeah. As startups scale, entering new markets, their success depends on a focused human capital strategy to foster their most valuable asset, their people. 
MIT says there are six principles of effective global talent management. One, alignment with strategy. Two, internal consistency. Three, cultural embeddedness. Four, management involvement. Five, balance of global and local needs. Six, employer branding through differentiation. That's a lot to handle. Harvard says that there have been more people that have resigned last year and the year before than any number in the history of time. Australia says that our gender pay gap has dropped to 13.8%, which is a win, but in tech, it's actually 24.4%. It's not good, guys. The book from Good to Great says we need to get the right people on the bus first, and then we can figure out where the bus is driving. So what do we do? <laughs> I'd like to introduce you to our panelists who will help us unpack our future of work. First up, we've got Jason Atkins down on the end, our co-founder and CEO of Cake. Next up, we have Alex Hatting, our Chief People Officer at Employment Hero. Then I'd love to introduce you to Anthony. Anthony Sochin, our co-founder of Think and Grow and looking very dapper today. Thank you for coming. And last but certainly not least, Paul Redfern, our head of programs at Startmate. Amazing. <clears throat> All right. So let's kind of start with a, you know, just a bit of an unpacking of what your global teams look like. Maybe we could start with you, Jace. Do you have a global team? Um, you know, do you have offices globally? Are they this remote workers? On. Yeah, we've, yeah. Re we've been global from the very beginning, really. Um, which is, uh, so I was fortunate enough, uh, my co-founder's from Denmark, but he lived in Lisbon for a really long time. So okay. we've got a little awesome team of devs and product people in Lisbon, which is, you know, pretty cool. Um, really powerful uh, tech city. Um, and then we're based on the Gold Coast, which is like an awesome Ooh. place to, <laughs> to run a company from. And... Uh, we're fortunate these days that you can run a global tech company from yeah. the Gold Coast, which is nice, but we have talent issues up there. You know, if we're going to try and build our whole company from mm. there, you know, we're probably going to have a, a bit of a hard time. So, yeah, about 18 months ago, we decided to be a remote first company. And so we set ourselves on that on that path. And now we have people in Canada and China and yeah, all around the place. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. What about yourself, Alex? Yes. Yeah, so we were not remote first prior to COVID. We were Sydney and Vietnam based. Uh, mm. However, I in, um, surveyed the team about two months into COVID, uh, well over two years ago. And it was about their well being. However, I threw in the question when we return to traditional work, who wants to go back? 92% of our people said absolutely not. So we went remote first and unbelievable that we limited our hiring to Sydney and Vietnam. We're now across more than 12 countries across the world. Our talent wow. pool has opened enormously. It's just been absolutely fabulous. Um, I'll answer this question two ways. So first for my own company, um, look, we're small, we're a consultancy, we work mainly with startups. Um, and our team's about 25 people, but we're across, I think, seven or eight locations now. Wow. Most of those are in Australia, but we've also got Dubai, London and Singapore. So we've just got people spread out. And look, honest to God, COVID just brought home that this whole mm. remote thing, you can work anywhere as long as you've got the right tools, the right practices, you're not doing too many sort of water cooler chats where you're excluding others. Um, you can make it work pretty easily. But um in terms of our customers, um, they're mainly sort of Series A plus businesses. So typically businesses from about 15 people all the way up to a couple thousand. Pretty much every single one of those businesses has a global team at the moment. So we've just seen this kind of crazy globalization of the workforce that got accelerated yeah. during COVID. Yeah. Yeah, um, Startmate is, uh, we're about 18. So we're, yeah. but we've grown. So we've been uh, we've put on about eight people in the last sort of six months, I think. So it's gone pretty pretty bananas, but all all local and all remote first. So we're we're remote first um, company. Right. Um, okay. So from the beginning of time, you were remote. Yeah, not from the beginning of time, but okay. we've we've really taken that approach um, definitely through through COVID. Yeah. And um, but similar to Anthony, um, the the companies that we work with um, and the people that we work with in all all manner of startups and scale ups across Australia, New Zealand, um, have some sort of 
need and drive and desire to either be there or moving into that space globally. Um, and that's just a necessity to try and find uh, growth opportunities and a market outside of a AU and NZ. Yeah, yeah. We'll start with you this time. I think we're going to be doing a little pass back and forth thing. Um, what are you doing right now to keep your your employees motivated or what are you seeing in the market that others are doing to keep employees motivated while working remotely? Yeah, I think similar to what Anthony was saying, you've, you've got to try and design and be purposeful about the design and space that you create for teams to, to participate remotely. Um, initially, uh, the temporary nature or the thoughtful position on temporary nature for COVID might have been, let's try a few things and see if they work and it got a bit clunky. Um, now it's a lot more about deliberate design. And so building that into um, the way that you work, the way that you um, design well, you know, products or services, um, the way that you interact and also being deliberate around um, the kind of interaction. So is it a social interaction or is it a professional performance interaction? Um, what's the purpose of the of the meeting? And, and unless you just sort of start to do that, it's really difficult to keep the culture and the fabric together, I think. That's good insight. What about you, Anthony? Um, I'll kind of answer the question with, in thinking about it from a kind of staff retention point of view. So mm. some of you might, you know, have staff working for you and some of you might be looking to hire. Um, but either way in this current market, you might be thinking, man, it's like really bloody hard to find good people. And so we've seen a couple of things um, companies have done really well. And um, I'll kind of do a little bit of a prelude for what Employment Hero has done. But one of the great things that I think Employment Hero did was they went very, very early on into uh, another country and they purposely built out um, a centre of ex excellence in um, product development um, in that country. Um, and I, I think sometimes, like, if you take this approach of, hey, we're just all global, we'll hire people everywhere, it, it doesn't always work. You've got to, like, design um, with a, a, a strategy and a purpose in mind. So I think that's, that's the first thing. The other thing is you've got to be prepared to... Um, give part of the company away, particularly if you're a founder, um, early on. So I think for a long time in Australia, we saw uh, founders being very reluctant to give out ESOP. Um, we do a salary survey every year. Uh, two years ago, we found that 27% of all employees of startups received ESOP. That's gone up to 39%. Um, anecdotally wow. today, we find about 80% of uh, staff all have uh, uh, shares in the business. So it's a huge tool for attack, attraction and uh, retention. Thanks, Anthony. And on that note, we do give every single employee ESOP. It is part of one of our values, which is own it. And our CFO gives updates on a quarterly basis so that our employees know exactly what our company is worth, what our valuation is and what their ESOP is. But back to Sarah's question and Sarah started in recruitment. I would start with your employer value proposition in being remote first. You want to make sure you are hiring people that align to your purpose and can work remotely so that they know how to motivate themselves each and every day. And then cadence. Cadence is really vital. So first of all, decide what you can do communication-wise asynchronous, which is um, not live, and the communications that you can do synchronously, which is a live meeting. And that's very, very hard to do across different geographies across the globe. So for some roles, we say remote, but minus or plus three hours um, Eastern Australian standard time and the first thing we did when we went remote first was to introduce our remote first principles which were our guiding principles for everyone across the globe and I got to say it was a challenge but one of them was if one person dials into a meeting everybody dials in it was tough. I would dial into our all hands on a Friday and 10 of our sales staff members, bless them, would be in our boardroom having beers. And I'd say, I want to be with you. I feel excluded. Go back to your desk, take your beer, dial in, and then you can go and have a drink at the bar afterwards. But it, it really is or it's such an important piece of inclusiveness when it comes to remote first. And back to cadence, manager one-on-ones on a weekly basis, super important. Yeah, we were celebrating yesterday at Cake. We could have a three-person meeting in the office together. <laughs> Kane and Cal and I, we actually got to do it. It was trippy. That's kind of where we're at these days, isn't it? Odd. Um, yeah, so how do we, I guess, motivate and align like a remote team? Um, I thought 
like three key things that we've done at Cake that I think have been successful so far. Um, so the first one is like structure and alignment. So around start mate time, the beginning of last year, we we sort of realized that we'd reached our point of like incompetence with regard to how we could put the team together in such a way that would motivate and align really great people to to want to you know work together and make them very effective. So we hired um, you know someone that was working in early Canva and Airtasker to come in and help us put that structure together. So that involved things like having cross-functional product teams uh, to put the product first, um, having you know vertical support teams, having a very good handbook so that when people come into the company, they understand how to you know engage in, in the best way possible. And that's been a real asset for us over the last 18 months and we're still leveraging that work. Um, the second thing, I guess, is a more cultural thing. Um, so we try and bring more humanity into the company. Um, things like, you know, we have, we call it internally creative, healthy lifestyles. So we talk a lot about our health. We have Slack channels about our health. We have challenges around that and it allows people to connect on a different level, no matter where they are and, and gets a lot of great feedback. Um, and there's even a pet, panel, a pet channel <laughs> where people post about their pets and stuff like that uh, and the third thing uh, I'll probably give uh, Dean uh, McAvoy a bit of credit for uh, we we have celebrations so uh, I think early on it's hard to um, well if you're not celebrating your wins it can feel like a really hard slog so uh, you know every 5k of new MRR we would have a celebration and every time we do that we make sure everybody's involved uh, it is a risky subject because you know like half the team might be celebrating together somewhere and going out and having beers so we really go to a lot of effort to make sure that everybody no matter where they are you know get to have a celebration and or they if they're on their own they get to take their partner and have a celebration uh, you know just to help keep everyone uh, aligned at that level I love that. And as a yoga teacher, I'm really aligned with this wellness thing. And also as a We dog run yoga lover, and surfing events, which seem to go down really well up there on not? the Gold Coast. Yeah, yeah, right? Employees want more fun. Um, now that more than ever, what we're seeing is because people can work remotely, they really have their pick of the litter when it comes to any startup, right? So we're all competing for this global talent. And it's not just startups competing for talent. It's actually countries now that are competing for talent, right? So I'd love, you know, Jace, if you could add some commentary on how you guys are finding the right talent globally. Like, is there any little hacks or tips? Yeah, so we hire, like, we're still relatively small, we're about 30 people now. So mm -hmm. we haven't reached that point where perhaps you have, where you've exhausted all your friends <laughs> <laughs> sort of thing. <laughs> You know, friends, um, <laughs> I would always advocate like, first of all, just be really good people. Like everybody wants to work with other good people. I think that's like probably the best thing to do. But um, we're really lucky because my co-founder, Kim, uh, you know, he has a great brand and a great network. And I think heads of product and engineering co-founders, I think that's a really great attribute. So that's been a big asset for us. But just in general, like we're hiring again now and it's really just been someone that someone on the team has worked with before, um, you know, they've got along really well. So that's that's been a big win for us. Um, look, I don't mean to say this in like, you know, in a bad way, but I think we have a good employer brand as well. We've worked really, really hard to um, provide a good place for people to work. And um, we spend a lot of time and effort on on nurturing that. And I think that really helps us as well. And who doesn't love cake? Alex, exactly. what, what, what happens when you run out of friends to hire? Oh, and it, <laughs> when I started at Employment Hero over four years ago, we were less than 100 people and that was Sydney and Vietnam only. We're now over 500 people globally looking to scale to 1,000 people by the end of this year. So it's a massive challenge. And well for any startup, you can't compete with the Atlassians and the Googles of this world. Um, so, so you do have to have that extra special piece of something that you can offer people. And that is purpose. So, so going back to, I think Anthony mentioned it before, you've really got to be a purpose 
product-led business as well as a product-led business. So what are you solving for the rest of the world? And then also recruiting globally has been massive for us. So we now offer a product where you can hire anyone across 54 countries in the world and we will take care of all of the pain. You're the host employer. We use the product ourselves um, to hire employees in countries where we don't have a legal entity and all of the pain is taken away and it means we can hire anyone in any country. It also means that our people can move to any country that they want to. So we've had uh, during COVID, a number of expats uh, from Australia take that advantage and move home, which has been fantastic. Um, it's a really interesting kind of thing, like this whole thing about global talent, the best people are in Silicon Valley and all that kind of rhetoric that you probably read about or hear about from others. But I kind of don't always buy into it in that, whilst we often get paid to go find those people and bring them home, and we've done it with mainly a lot of Aussies, we found them in Silicon Valley, so the original head of engineering who was at Canva, Joel, we brought him back here to go run engineering for Canva and scale that out. But you actually don't want to be fishing globally, and the reason for that is um, if you're fishing in Silicon Valley, you're competing with Uber, you're competing with Google, you're competing with uh, Square, Stripe, Etsy, you know, Dropbox, there's all these businesses that have spent a hell of a lot of money to make themselves um, talent acquisition machines. Whereas at least here, like you've got Atlassian, you've got, you know, Canva that are very, very good at it. Um, Employment Hero is good at it. But, you know, there's maybe two dozen businesses that are maybe amazing at acquiring talent. So it's just a bit more of an easy sort of playing field. And so whilst global talent's great, I wouldn't always go and compete in, in busier markets. It, it, it can lead to a huge waste of resources. Oh, that was a good setup. Thank you. Because, um, I mean, for everyone who knows no Start, mate, we, um, we run a bunch of programs and we were just talking about this earlier. And um, uh, we've got the Women Fellowship that's on at the moment. And there's a hundred fantastic women that are going through um, all across Australia and New Zealand. And the whole purpose of that program is to try and introduce um, net new talent from diverse backgrounds into the startup ecosystem. And so, I mean, um, who's had hires from, from Startmate before? Some, yeah, Jace has had some hires from Startmate, some uh, Jamie up the back from Finder. And so the whole purpose there is you might come from a non-traditional background, accounting, I was talking this story before, accounting into painting, into UX design, and now this woman has this um, d drive to find a purpose-led organisation to apply that craft. So I, I, would, I would wholeheartedly agree there's uh, a plethora of talent locally um, um, available and um, sometimes you just have to find the right, right way and right channel to get there. Um, I just want to reiterate what, what, you, what Jason said and, and also um, just the structure is really important as well. So having a purpose-driven, and Alex, you know, you mentioned purpose-driven um, company, um, product-led company, um, the supporting structure for the, for the organisation to support that's so important. Um, otherwise, it does just sort of feel like it's a bit of um, riding on a, on a cup sort of thing. And that, and that might have got you through before, but I think right now the structure has to be there as well to support it and back it up. We've seen some pretty awesome things come out of Startmate. I know at AWS, we're always talking about Startmate. Um, like, is, is ANZ the place to be if you're a startup? What do you reckon? Yeah, again, I think what Anthony mentioned there, there's a talent element and there's also, I mean, again, we just ran demo day for the Accelerator cohort um, a couple of weeks back. The companies that are coming through are ridiculous. The, the, the talent and ingenuity here locally is unbelievable. So, I mean, again, biased, but it's a fantastic place to be. I think also just acknowledging that there's such large also talent pools and opportunities um, internationally as well. So I would say it's a great place to create startups, we'll start from the Gold Coast and tap into talent um, externally. I'll, I'm coming to your your place, mate, to do some yoga and surfing. That'd be great. Um, <laughs> But, but also just, just think about where there's advantages in different markets, set up a center of excellence in, in, other, in other places and, mm. and know what the purpose and the strategy is behind that. Yeah, it's really good balance. What about um, tips on navigating like mixed country laws, different cultural nuances? 
um, it, it really just employee management. Yeah, I, I was thinking, let's go to Alex for that one. I'll jump in here. Uh, <laughs> don't do it. Like, don't be bothered with it. Just go with a solution like global teams that we provide. We navigate everything for you. You would be the host employer. We're the employer of record. We navigate everything down to and including difficult employee issues, such as if you have to exit someone from the business and onboarding them, local legislation, payroll, too complex to get your head around it globally. Good answer. Oh, he wants it real bad. There you go. Oh, you've also got to look after your global ESOP as well. So a bit of experience yeah. from us. Like <laughs> Casual. We've, had, we've had to do it. Like, <laughs> like so many things we've done at Cake and founders out there will know this. Oh, we're, we're a little bit meta because we're a startup and we work with startups. So it's a bit different yeah. for us. Like every challenge we have are like, oh, we're productizing that. <laughs> you know, we're pro so we're growing and oh, we want to have a, an advisor in the US and the advisor's like, you know, sweet, uh, in the US, everybody gets some options for an advisory role. And mm -hmm. we're like, oh yeah, cool, this shouldn't be too hard. You know, so we've already got a US lawyer. We're a US top company now. Yeah. We did that last year, but it was going to cost us like 7,000 US dollars to hire one advisor and give him a compliant like offer letter. And we thought, hang on a sec. This can't be right. And then we wanted to have another advisor in India to help us launch there. And it was the same problem there. And so we asked some of our customers, how are you guys doing this? And you should see the amount of work they're having to go through. So I think this is an area where, unfortunately, we're all going to have to, to, to tackle this. And it's a big part of our mission now to you know, help Australian startups initially um, to have compliant uh, global ESOP. Yeah. Chase, just for those that are online and maybe listening from elsewhere, can you define ESOP? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> well, depending on where you are, like most of you be in Australia, we call it an ESOP here. Uh, so employee share option plan. So it's, um, I guess, it's a legal term. An option is part of your equity uh, without being too technical. So um, you want to give some ownership to your team um, to help attract the right people. So quite often initially in the startup land, you can't afford to perhaps pay, you know, full enterprise wages. Not that I'm advocating underpaying people by any stretch, but you know, you might want to top up their wages with a, with a few extra options. And um, I think, you know, with the success of companies like Employment Hero and others, it's yeah. really attractive for, you know, um, the right people with the right mindset. They want skin in the game. They want to experience part of the upside. So you give them options. And then as the company grows in value, um, you know, your employees will benefit. Sorry, and just on that note, in terms of EVP, um, we've created an ESOP playbook because for a lot of people in Australia, they don't know a lot about ESOP. It's really quite foreign. Whereas if you work for a public company, as a lot of us have, you get RSUs, you can see what the value is on the public stock exchange. So we present candidates with the value of their ESOP rather than saying you're getting a thousand employee shares, which means nothing. We talk to them, you know, your strike price is at whatever it is. So if you started with us five years ago during series A, our strike price was five cents. We're now valued at $26.50 uh, per share. So for people that got stock op options those five years ago, it's really a significant value for them today. And so presenting that value to um, candidates is, is really, really very good in terms of attracting people. Awesome. Um, being an account manager now at AWS, I often am asking my customers this one question because I feel like it's a great question to ask them and I like Harry Potter. So I always say to them, I say, if I could give you a magic wand, you could wave it and make anything happen. What would it be? Like, how can I help you, right? They're always saying, find me great talent, like nine times out of 10, just find me great talent, that's what I need. So, you know, working backwards from that goal for those customers, are there other ways of value apart from equity? Like what are you seeing in the market of what talent wants these days? Um, apart from all the kind of things- The like usual. Equity, the all pay. the usual things, um, meaning and purpose. Uh, so connection to really the why of your business is doing what it's doing. And so um, I think Alex has talked a lot about an EVP. For those that don't know what that is, it means employee value proposition. What it actually means is uh, the full kind of stack of different uh, elements 
as to why someone would work for your company. So you've got kind of mission, vision, purpose, then you've got remuneration, then you've got uh, organisational culture, then you've got the different kind of employee perks. Uh, have I missed anything? No. Nope. Um, yep, career development as well. And so it's that full stack of everything together that creates an employee value proposition. And so um, that's something if you kind of lean into it, spend a bit of time putting it together, you're going to be in a better position to attract people. I think things like authority, autonomy, creativity, uh, very, very important, especially for people that might be sort of towards the middle of their careers. You know, they might have three to five, well, that's probably not the middle, is it? I'm 44 now, but like, so they've done, you know, three, five, eight years in, in like we're all tech people here, right? In tech and they've got a wealth of experience and knowledge, but they've perhaps worked in, in larger teams. I think it's really, really strong in those, in some of those people that they want to, you know, then go into a role where they can take a step up uh, and have more ability to impact not only that company, but aligned to a mission that they really care about. That's awesome. And um, I'd second all of that, but I'd also add trust. Uh, so something massive that we found when we went remote first was managers grappled a little bit with how do we, how do I trust that my employees are actually doing what they're supposed to do? Well, just trust them and they'll do it. So base all of your trust on output, not the number of hours that someone is working. Who cares if someone's playing Minecraft for three hours a day, as long as they're doing their job and kicking butt, who cares? Um, so you've really got to display that trust to them, especially in this remote first kind of work. I love that. What about you, Paul? Are you seeing any other nuances? No, I just think it comes back to maybe the shift. I think I was talking to Jamie about this actually, that like the shift from uh, maybe perks to like benefits. And so this concept mm. of holistic, whole human type living, you know, um, I agree if you're playing Minecraft for a portion of your day, but it's sort of that diffuse model of thinking and you're letting things marinate and then you're coming back to a lot of focused performance element. Fantastic. Like, like we try to encourage that at start, mate. Like we want people to to open up new ideas and creativity. And so the trust or the, and again, the structure and the environment that you create for that, I think is what people are craving. And that's just been more pronounced through COVID. Yeah, yeah I love that. Remember when we used to talk about work-life balance? Like did, that was probably popular term of like 2010 or something. Now it's work-life harmony. It's very different, right? <laughs> Um, let's talk a little bit about the future of work now. So, you know, uh, AI, ML, augmentation of staff, globalization. What do we see coming into play here when we think about work in the future? Any takers? I mean, I'll just I'll just start and I'll happy pass on just a quick one. But um, I still think that having a strong purpose, um, being whole human, is going, and the creativity element is is the sort of key outcome that Human. we're striving for. Yeah. And, and then any ways that you can, you know, decentralize or automate some of the more meaningless sort of tasks, then fantastic. I mean, we're all in a different, we're in that different space here, I think, in the tech and startup, in the, you know, software world mostly. But there's other areas that AI, I think ML will play a, a different role, but um, an automation. But I think in our world, that creativity and ingenuity, any way that we can foster more of that on a human sense is, mm. I think, what I'd love to see happen. I love that. Um, nothing to add, really. Like, agreed. Yeah, would second everything, but also um, focus on what can be asynchronous versus synchronous. It allows you to really foster that global teams. Uh, also, Sarah has touched on this and something that is so close to my heart is that work has to be fun. It can't be all work. You have to work hard and play hard. So figure out in this remote world of work, how do you insert fun? And um, I think you made the point earlier about reward and recognition. How do you keep that celebration going? And we often get feedback at, our, at Employment Hero that we're constantly celebrating sales and marketing now that's because they're extroverts and they're constantly on slack celebrating each other so figure out a way to make sure you're you're celebrating everyone in the company no matter what role they're in and you're inserting fun in every single day that, that you have at work yeah so i hope this isn't like a captain obvious comment but i think the, the globalization of the workforce particularly in tech is accelerating faster than most people would realize first it was outsourcing to a couple of countries because they had, I guess, economies of scale with people. But now it is just like a 
almost a total global smorgasbord of so many skills and and you know time zones and you know all the different roles and it's it's really an incredible shift that is going on obviously accelerated by covid so um you know in our company particularly at cake you know we're thinking well we need to sort of handle apac and the us and the uk now but we're like such a small company and we can be thinking you know with the help of technology like employment hero well we could hire and engage some people in southeast asia to handle singapore and latin america to handle the us and like this isn't a new concept outsourcing or whatever but this is more augmentation i suppose and yeah. and just the the choice that you have and the tech that you have to enable it is has come along tremendously and i just thought of one other thing i think more so we're going to see like the tech and the product first and the people supporting it even more i feel like tech historically has enabled the people but there's still a big shift occurring where the tech is going in front and and the people are going behind if that makes sense uh, certainly seeing that um even even at cake we're being product led so uh, how do you let the product do the work for you and um yeah i think it's a strong trend that'll continue yeah. You just look at Elon Musk's gigafactories and things like yeah. that. It's just going and going and going. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> right? I love the, the global smorgasbord of talent. Love it. <laughs> we that, we have is one that of those wrong? Later. I hope that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we we have we have one of those later. Oh, we've got the food for you later. Um I I'm a big lover of hindsight, you know. Uh if each one of you could just give us like a tip or a like, don't do this, or a, I'd do this again if I could do it again. What's that one tangible thing? Yeah, I found this one really hard, but I, I decided to go with um, a bit of advice we got early on about like building a hiring engine. So the two big roles, like, I guess once you find some product market fit, you need to build a growth engine and a hiring engine. And I think when I heard, when I first heard that, it really hit me about like, well, what does that mean? You know, and um, it's been a real journey for us to to understand that, but it's, you know, how do you attract the right people? How do you hire the right people at the right time? How do you bring them on and activate them and align them? How do you, you know, retain them? And uh, there really is a lot to it. And I think the more you can get that right, um, you know, the more successful you can be. Yeah, gosh, I could spend hours on this. Um, look, one of the things I will have to say about Employment Hero is that Ben Thompson invested in people and culture super early. I had um, implemented Employment Hero at a startup in Sydney and when he talked to me, Series B, I kind of said, oh, maybe you should be hiring someone more junior. And he said, no, no, culture is really important. We need to hire someone at the top and then build your team. But in hindsight, I would have pushed earlier to grow my team further and faster because now that we've got the great resignation and this talent shortage, my team are really suffering from a volume perspective. So in hindsight, I would have grown my talent acquisition team much, much sooner. Um, what Alex said, um, that's exactly what a lot of our clients need to do, is invest in talent, invest in people and culture, and do it very, very early. So in the US, we notice that one of your first 10 or 15 hires will be someone in talent acquisition or people and culture. It's very, very, very early. 50. We don't do it until 50, yeah, exactly. And so what it actually means for that first person coming in at 50 to 100 is you're playing catch up. And so it's a bit of a dog's breakfast for them. Um, it's not great. So that, that would be the main thing from a, in terms of my, my customers. In terms of ourselves, it would actually be hire more senior people sooner. Like just don't worry about the doing as much. Get people who can build the engine and then you'll figure out how to do the execution. Get the people on the bus, then figure out where the bus is going. Yeah. Oh, yeah, fly the plane as you're building. I like that one. That's a little more startup. Yeah. Alex, Anthony, exactly the same. Um, and this is the kind of conversations we have as well. Um, uh, startups early on, this, early on, you can't hire great people. I mean, even if you're a fantastic uh, people background person and you're a founder, you need someone to help build that engine up. So get them in as early as possible and help them find great talent. Um, and then personally, uh, I was just reflecting on my experience in the last couple of years um, around the use of technology and the way that we communicate and the whole world. I, I, if I go back, I would have thought, yeah, 
maybe the connection points that I would have designed for my team would have been different. Less maybe Zoom meetings, more deliberate spaces, what I mentioned at the start. But um, yeah, that's a personal learning. Amazing. I'd love to open it up to the audience now. Absolutely any question. Is this an AMA? Anything? Ask us anything. Yeah. So I'll bring the mic to you. Um, just raise your hand if you'd like to ask any of our panelists. Yes. I'm coming over. Um, Alex, a question for you mainly, and, I, and mainly, mainly for everyone else on the panel as well. Like, what do you think is like the biggest change in behaviour from a company level that's happened because of this remote first? So, you know, a system, a process, a thing that you think has had the biggest impact, and and or um, yeah, what do you think? May, a thing you think has had maybe the biggest impact on the, the change in behaviour? Fantastic question, and. For me, it's a wonderful impact, and that is managers being more empathetic and caring about their people. So we introduced a one-on-one -on -one template for weekly one-on-ones during COVID, and part of that was checking in with someone's mental well-being. How happy are you at work? How happy are you at home? How can I support you? And creating that psychological safety to be able to express how people are feeling, and managers have just opened up to it and brought it on, and it's been such a fantastic change. Did you just do some training for them or something? Or? Training, one-on-one -on -one templates, um, and then other people started to see other people taking it on, and then we gave people permission if they didn't have a one-on-one -on -one booked in their diary to book it themselves, so if managers weren't booking it was, Alex, it's up to you to book. If you don't have a one-on-one -on -one with Ben, you go and book it in his calendar, so giving that permission was really, really key. Has anyone else found like because you're talking to people in their bedrooms or whatever, like it's so much easier to have a personal work conversation? Plus, like you kind of have to if you're not seeing people at all, and then you go work, 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 work in the one on one. It's just totally inhumane and brutal, isn't it? So I feel like I can really understand how that's had such a huge impact. Yeah. I, um, on that point, I was chatting to Lauren Humphrey from the Mintable and, you know, a great company um, started to try and help managers, sort of first time managers, especially like level up. And she was talking about how much in her programming has come into like how to have more empathetic conversations. So th there's great tools and courses and things out there and companies are doing it well, but there's also just depth of knowledge that's out there and people are really gravitating towards it. So I'd agree. I, I love how people have become more empathetic. Managers have become more empathetic. They do some fantastic work. They do. Right on. Do we have other questions? Yes, I'm coming over to you. Uh, this question is for Jason. Um, first of all, great um, ESOP package for startups, by the way. Um, oh, we're getting there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and on the, on the matter of ESOP, um, for a new startup, how do you go about evaluating the company's valuation so that you can relay that to the potential employee? Yeah, so the hardest one is the uh, like the first one before you've done a priced round, um, if that's what you sort of mean right in the beginning. Um, you do need to have some sort of valuation. Uh, well, you actually, you don't have to if you don't want to. You could, for example, just say, because you're the first five employees, everybody gets 1% or something like that. And you just do it based on a percentage. Um, I don't think that really solves the problem very well um, because it's hard, as you said, to then equate that to a dollar figure. Uh, so I would always advocate using something like the Berkus method, a uh, very, very simple and practical valuation method. Has been a little bit thrown out the window the last few years with the way valuations have gone. But I think somewhere between the, you know, the Berkus method or, or just you know some rules of thumb. So you might say, look, on day one, hiring my first couple of employees, we're valuing that we've used the Berkus method, we're valuing it two million, and you know we're allocating you one percent, so that's worth twenty thousand um, dollars. It's it's always very important to create an actual valuation. Uh, once you've done a round, so you know you've seen round might be at say five million pre, um, then you would peg the amount of options that they're receiving to that valuation. Uh, normally until the next round or the next valuation, unless they're very far apart or there's a very material change in, in the company valuation in the meantime. And I would almost always advocate in that situation that it's you know based on, on salary. So they might be earning $100,000 and they're getting 10% or 20% on top of their salaries. It's very easy to calculate the dollar amount 
and then compare that to the valuation of the company and then calculate the number of options from there. And should you offer like an ESOP to a potential co-founder if you've come across someone that you think could, you know, help you propel the, the, the you, company? You can. Um, the Australian rules would limit you to 10% um, to get the tax concession. Um, so that would normally be, I suppose, a, a later starting co-founder, um, not normally a day one co-founder because they'd normally have, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50%. Um, so it can be used for those, those later co-founders up to 10%. Um, and if you wanted to, you could do a second ESOP um, for a co-founder. Uh, where the option there's a different way to set it up. There's different rules. They don't get the tax concession, um, but you can still do tax deferral. It's a bit complicated, but you can have a separate ESOP with separate rules if you want to go above 10%, um, but you could potentially just use your, your shareholders agreement and investing for that as well. So there's a few ways to do that. I'm not giving any legal advice as soon as this is being recorded. Uh, this is general advice. I have a few ideas about this, but um, we have legal partners that can help you with that if you need it uh, in, more, in more detail. <laughs> Good cover at the end there. Um, any other questions? Yes, coming down. Just firstly, the, the content's been awesome and um, really genuine. And I think the question I have is more from a different angle of as we were going into the pandemic and the working from home, remote working, I think everyone went first to the trust piece around are our teams going to be trustworthy? I think if you're doing all the stuff you spoke about today with hiring the right people, motivating them, giving them a purpose, somewhat you actually have the, the, the other side of the coin, which is a bigger problem where you've got people so motivated they're not in front of you anymore and you can't see how long they're working or if they're having enough of a break and burnout can occur. Um, did you see any of this happen or, you know, is for those out there, because I've worked with small teams and larger teams through that pandemic, but I actually think if you're doing all the right things, that's a bigger problem to a business in regards to retaining outside of remuneration and the like. Just quickly, it was a really challenging time, obviously for everyone, especially um, for us in the first year was the most challenging. Um, a lot of tech companies are relatively unscathed and, um, you know, for example, you're selling everything digitally, you perhaps have, you know, knowledge workers creating, you know, your main inputs. Um, so we're lucky in many ways. Um, we have health as one of our core values in our company. So, you know, keeping an eye on everybody, having regular one-on-ones, uh, having really close personal relationships with everyone in the company, um, I guess has really helped us get through. From a founder perspective, like it was it was a lot, you know, so um, you can actually, you know, go see a psychologist or whatever. I remember actually going and getting some help and, and saying, look, this is just a bloody nightmare, you know, and with a bit of help, I actually like got through it like way better than I thought I would. And, and we offered that to the team as well. Like if people were really struggling during that time, uh, we made, we made this professional available. Uh, nobody actually took it up, which was cool. But um, I guess that was another thing we tried to do, but um, yeah, it was, it was a tough time. Um, but yeah, with regard to like monitoring people's hours and stuff like that, it, it is a tricky one. Um, and, you know, we, we sort of run a little bit with the, with the Jason Calacanis mindset, which is like, you know, we want sort of a team with Olympian mindsets, you know, like it's a pretty hard thing we're doing. So we're probably always erring on the other side of that coin. But um, there's a difference between going hard and burnout. And, and that's probably the big, the big thing to look out for, um, which, we, which we haven't seen. So we're quite fortunate, yeah. Yeah, I'd say the same. We hire very similar people. So we did see a lot of burnout. So we had an employee assistance program, but also through those manager one-on-ones, teaching managers to look out for burnout. And also one thing I did in my team um, was introduced a Slack bot at the end of each day at 5.30 to ask them for the highlight of their day, personal or professional, a great day to remind them to clock off um, and to celebrate something during their day. And also managers need to keep a lookout for people that are online for too many hours or on weekends as well, or you do see that burnout absolutely um <laughs> yeah we noticed that problem we did three things one was we gave people permission to talk about how they were feeling 
Um, and we started that by doing it ourselves as, as leaders. I think that's a, a great way to start. Second thing was we um, had a coach uh, come into the business. So that person was um, pretty much doing almost a day a week with us as a, as a company and doing a whole bunch of one-on-ones. And it's quite a big investment to get a professional coach to, to do that. But what we found it did was it allowed people to uh, use that time to understand themselves better. And through understanding them themselves, they could then help manage their own energy levels better, but also become better at communicating how they were feeling. So then I or someone else in the business could step in and, and help them. And then the last thing we did, because what we found is despite all that, people actually kind of saw work as like this safety net. It was like, you know, it's psychologically safe to like just be at work because I don't have to watch the news, think about the pandemic, know that I can't go see my friends and go outside. And so they just like zoned in on it and worked worked a lot. We just forced them to take time off. So we gave people an extra, I think in the end last year, it was an extra 11 days off uh, that they had. So particularly when we were out of lockdown, it was like, right, three days off in a row, off you go, you know, go enjoy yourself. And and that was really powerful. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of the similar um, statements. Um, I, th I think there's some things you can do through governments like policy and stuff, which is great. You can, you can enforce, um, we have library hours where we work and so, and there's actually people who sort of like patrol Slack channels and be like, hang on, you know, don't don't be sending messages at these times. And a bit harder if you're working in the global company, but but finding finding a balance, I think, is really important. Um, and, and I just think um, being aware and again, if you're designing for a whole human type of experience rather than just a work experience, because I think if you think about the future of work, you're actually thinking about the future of families, the future of communities. Um, and I think this has gone from theoretically, maybe we're going to do this to like, now we have to do this. And so you are designing for allowing and pick up kids in the afternoon and it's okay, your work's done and go spend time with family. And so when you come back tomorrow, you'll be fully dialed in. And so, yeah, we had some people experience some, some, some of those moments and we just tried to create those environments where we could have honest conversations. And I think to Anthony's point as well, you have to, you have to demonstrate it. You have to show up first. If you're, if you're in a leadership position, um, demonstrate that vulnerability. Definitely. Good tips. I've got a wellness day tomorrow, actually. AWS gave us the day off. I know. What am I up to? Oh, I don't even know yet. Golfing. I'll be golfing. Depending on the weather. Yeah. Yes, Kim. I messaged her. We're going to golf together. She's in Melbourne. Uh, I have time for one more question. Julie, I think it's going to be you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I uh, am really interested to know who was your first hire back in the day when you were just a startup. Um, so I'm, I'm, that's where I'm at. So in the next few months, I need to hire someone. Um, and I'm really scared to take that step because there are so many jobs that need to be done. Um, and I just don't know like which role to fill first. Um, I do have people coming to me asking, you know, to work for us and they're really great people, but I just don't know. So I'm really interested to know back in the day when you were a struggling startup, who was your first hire and, and, you know, was it a good decision that you made or was there anything that you learned from it that you can share? I'm just going to jump in just very quickly because I'm just going to say it, it's a big, it depends because if you are a technical Co-founder, maybe you need someone with um, business acumen to come come in. Depends what your what your proposition and problem you're trying to solve for. Um, I know some people in the in the sciences on the med tech side, so they're very good in the science division, and they need someone to sort of come in with some commercial experience on the outside. So uh, unfortunately, it, it really does. It is. It depends. We can have a drink and a chunk conversation afterwards if you like. Um, only thing I'd say is be be careful if uh, you've got friends coming to you. Um, oftentimes. Uh, we can um, make a mistake and those people don't have the skills to help you in the business. Um, but it's actually very difficult to let friends go. So um, uh, I think to Paul's point, you've got to be very, very purposeful and very specific about what problem you're trying to solve and therefore based on that, what skills you need to bring in. 
Yeah, I'd second both Paul and Anthony, and that is what skill sets don't you have? So I wasn't um, part of Employment Hero when it first was founded. However, Ben Thompson knew full well that once he'd done his Series A, he needed to bring in a co-founder that was an expert in product and technology, which um, helped to fill the gaps that he didn't have, and then a CFO next. So you've just got to look at building out the skills. However, I will note, we, we had this conversation earlier today, we've recently hired a chief of staff, and um, in convincing Ben to hire that role at first, he was kind of well isn't that a glorified EA and then he met with Amy from Atlassian and we ended up hiring um, Zara who's with us now and she has just made a transformational difference to how the ELT operate and holding us accountable it's just been phenomenal oh my god that sounds amazing <laughs> <laughs> any of that any of that uh, yeah so I guess uh, right in the beginning, we we had done like we had a startup, and then we did a big painful pivot, and we had like a core team of like four, and we were very engineering kind of heavy. And early on, we used this book called Traction, which sort of talks about having half your team and effort on the customer and marketing and sales, and half on you know product and engineering. And I think it can be a big trap early on just to build your product. Uh, you know, too long without ha having enough interaction with the customer. So I'll just be trying to get that yin and yang right um, with your company. And then my other comment would be not, you know, my understanding is you have to do the stuff that doesn't scale first, and then you do the stuff that scales. So it's difficult because another part of my mind says get to the business model that you want as fast as possible and set that up as early as possible but you do have to do the stuff that doesn't scale first so just bear that in mind when you're hiring um, people that are good at hand-to-hand -hand combat um, in whatever those key things that you need to get done are pretty valuable thank you so much to our panelists jason alex anthony paul we really appreciate it I think, you know, this is the beauty of the startup ecosystem here in Australia. We have leaders, we can ask questions. So let's go do that. Please try and network with someone. If you go home and you've established a connection with someone or had a qu one question answered, then you've won tonight, right? So we've got some drinks, some food over in the room there for those online. Thank you so much for tuning in and we will close up. We'll see you in the other room. Thanks everyone.